We're going to be reading out of 1 Samuel chapter 1, and we're going to read all the way through chapter 1, and we're going to read up to chapter 2, verse 10. I titled this morning's message, A Seed of Faith and a Harvest from God. And so we're going to go ahead and go to 1 Samuel chapter 1 now. Maybe before we get started, uh, like I sometimes will like to do, kind of give us a little bit of an idea of where we are in the history of Israel. Um, I always kind of start with the fall when I do my timeline, you know, mankind, Adam and Eve in the garden fell. You know, we talk about the fact that God has a plan when in creation, when we, when we talk about the book of Genesis, and the fact that God created the heavens and the earth, and all that in them is... We saw that there was a very methodical approach by God of creation. In other words, he didn't create plant life until he first had created the sun and water because you can't have photosynthesis without those things. But when it's all said and done and we see how God went about orchestrating creation, we realize that God's desire was ultimately for man to have a place to, to create a place that was habitable or a place where mankind could live because God desired to have relationship. We learned that about the character of God through the scriptures, that God, for whatever reason, David looked at himself in a mirror, it seems like in one of the Psalms, he said, who is man that you are mindful of him? In other words, you know, we probably have all asked ourselves the same question. And the enemy would try to lie to us and tell us, why would God want to have a relationship with you? And, and what I would tell you is this, is that, that that's what the enemy does. He will lie to you. He will speak into whisper into your ears. But the reality of it is, is that God does want to have a relationship with you. And that's the whole reason that he uh, allowed creation to take place to, in the beginning. But man and his disobedience towards God in the fall caused a separation between that relationship. So really the entirety of the Bible story after creation, after the fall, is the story of redemption. The story of reconciliation. What does that mean? That's some fancy words. It means that two parties are separated from one another. And God's all about the business of bringing them back together. Amen. And, but it required something to be, uh, to, a payment to be paid to pay the penalty of sin. The Bible teaches us that the wages of sin is death. The result of sin is death. And that God had to allow death to take place to pay the penalty of sin. But like I've been saying for many years, your death, my death, isn't going to do any good because we deserve to die. And so God went about pre preparing a plan that would allow the death of, the right, of a righteous one, the one who had no sin, in order to pay the penalty for the sins of humanity. And so I don't mean to belabor the point, but, but after the fall, uh, you know, there was this ne the next big thing on the horizon was the flood. And then after that, there was a tower of Babel. And uh, after that, God called a man named Abraham. And I know we talk about this a lot. And hopefully you're probably at the point now where you can teach it yourself. But there's some people in here that probably couldn't teach it themselves. And I want to just introduce you to this person named Abraham. Can you say Abraham? Can you say it in your head? Abraham. Abe. This is, we can call him Abe for short. You might not know him, but I'm here to introduce you to him. He was, a, he was a man that lived in the midst of a society or a world that wasn't serving God. There was no nation called Israel at the time. Does anybody know who Israel is? Or, you know, maybe we got some young people in here today. I don't even know what Israel is. Well, Israel's a nation. It's a little bitty country that's in the, that's in the east that was created by God. A country that was created by God for God because God had a purpose for this country. But it doesn't just have a purpose for a country. It has a purpose for each and every individual life. And this is a time before there ever was a country called Israel. And God called this man named Abraham out and said, hey, you got to come out of your daddy's house. You got to leave your daddy's house. And, and he said, I'm going to make a nation out of you. Now, what you and I need to understand is, is that if we're going to serve God, we're going to have to leave the world and we're going to come into the kingdom of God. We're not going to be able to continue to operate the same way that everybody else operates around us. The world is heading in one direction, thinks everything's cool, but the kingdom of God is saying something completely different. It's communicating a different message. It's communicating a message of separation. And so God told Abraham, come out from your father's house and separate yourself and I'm going to make a nation out of you and through this nation all uh, people of the earth are going to be blessed or through this and through this seed all people of the earth will be blessed. Well, a seed is offspring. 
Well, Abraham, he had, he had a son named Isaac, and, and Isaac had uh, two sons, but the main one I want to talk about is Jacob, and Jacob's name was changed to Israel. It's a long story on how it happened, but he had a wrestling match with God, and God touched him and broke him spiritually and changed his name. And the important thing that you need to understand this morning, and maybe you didn't understand it before, is that God will allow you to go through a process or a journey in your life, just like he allowed that to happen to Jacob. But he will bring you to a place where he breaks you, if you'll allow him to, and he'll change your name. Your name describes character. And, and the character that you were before, when God doesn't work in your life, it's going to be different than what it was before. Because God does a miracle on the inside of people's lives. God changed Jacob's name to Israel. And that through that nation Israel, God, uh, God had created a people that ultimately that's where Jesus came from. Amen. But before this nation entered into the promised land and became the nation called Israel, they left through the Exodus. You remember that story, the Exodus, the Red Sea, and God delivered them out on that night of the Passover. And then they wandered around in a wilderness for 40 years. And then God, through a man named Joshua brought Israel, the nation Israel, into this place called the promised land. And then Joshua died. And then for four, about 400 years, there was this time frame known as the Judges. It's within the time frame of the Judges that our story takes place this morning. Uh, and so we're reading out of 1 Samuel chapter 1. And just remember, this is before, uh, before there's ever a king. There's no king at this point in time yet in Israel. Israel's first king was Saul. But the king that God had planned for Israel was David. And even within the story that we're going to read this morning... One of the main concepts of what's going on, you wouldn't know it if you hadn't really read the Bible and really been aware of the history of Israel. But there's a big part to this story having to do with the king that God has planned for his people. And even the people of the characters of the story don't even really realize the magnitude that that is playing out on the stage. The point that I'm trying to make with that is this. As always, God has a big old plan of salvation for humanity. But in the midst of that big plan that he has for the whole world, he is involved in individual lives. And we're going to see that truth played out in the story this morning, especially with this character of a young woman named Hannah. First Samuel chapter one, starting in verse one. <clears throat> now, there was a certain man of Ramoth Amzaphim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jehoram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu the son of Zuth, an Ephrathite, and he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah. Now, you know, the Bible doesn't, God always intended for there to be one man and one woman uh, that, that would be man and wife, but there was no law that, that said that they could not have more than one. Um, and so what it seems as though really is that what goes on in the time frame of Israel and, and God's people is that uh, they, <clears throat> God did not specifically tell them that he couldn't, but at the same time, he explained what he expected. And many times people don't always walk according to God's perfect will, even God's people. And so I just want to let you know that this particular man, he definitely had, he had two wives and other uh, heroes of the faith had more than that. So it says in the name of the other, and the name of the one was Hannah and the name of the other was Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. Now, one thing that I'll just make a point is, because this is kind of interesting if you don't know this, there was a time frame that the Ark of God, or y'all, most of y'all are familiar with what the Ark was. Um, some of you probably may not have a clue of what the Ark was. But we're not talking about Noah's Ark. Now we're talking about the Ark of the, of the Tabernacle that was behind the veil inside of the tabernacle. Um, and that's where the blood was applied. And that's where God would meet the high priest. The high priest would go in there once a year and they would worship the Lord. Well, there was a time frame before the temple was built where the ark was rested in a city called Shiloh. And that's where the tabernacle was. 
was. And that's where they would worship the Lord. And so just as these annual feasts that were spoken of in the book of Leviticus, where the children of Israel were supposed to go worship the Lord, and, 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 and with time they would go do that in Jerusalem after David built the temple in Jerusalem. Before that time frame, the annual feast took place in Shiloh at the tabernacle. And so what we're hearing here, here is that Elkanah was a man that served the Lord, and he would go to Shiloh for the annual feast, and he would worship the Lord. He would bring sacrifice unto the Lord. And, um, and so that's, uh, and, and, and the Bible also mentions the fact that Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there. And Hophni and Phinehas did not live for the Lord the way that they were supposed to. We'll read some, some scriptures. Uh, Eli was getting old. He was getting old. The Bible says he was becoming dim in his sight. He couldn't see properly. But also, there's a, and, and you know, that's a physical thing. But it, there also seems to be a spiritual truth connected to that when you read the story. We won't be able to get into all of it. But there seems to be a spiritual connection to it because of the fact that it also says that the temple of the, that the light in the, in the temple had gone out. Well, the light was never supposed to go out. That light was supposed to burn perpetually. It was the priest's duty to make sure that it never ran out of oil to trim the wick. But under Eli's leadership, that light went out and his eyes were dim. And also when Samuel, he's a hero, of the, one of the big parts to this story, whenever he is actually born and he's in the temple, <coughs> Temple, he's able to hear the voice of God, but Eli can't. And so what we're seeing here is a spiritual condition that's taking place where the leadership can't see, can't hear, right? And um, and in Eli and Phineas, which are Eli's offspring, I'm sorry, Hophni and Phineas, which are Eli's offspring, they're, they're not living for God at all. And so we have a spiritual condition in the society that's messed up. But not only that, we have a spiritual condition of the leadership that's messed up. And so uh, it says in verse 4, And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Peninnah his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. So what we see here is a... If you can imagine it, I mean, this morning when I read it, I kind of got this picture of Christmas Day. The best way I could think of it. Christmas Day, and you got... You got two sets of families. You got two wives. You got one wife named Hannah, and she's over here on this side. You got another wife named Peninnah. She's over here on this side. Peninnah's got children. And so you're over here, and you're distributing the blessings to the two and to the two different families, right? And if you can imagine being a kid when you were growing up, you had a sister maybe. Could you imagine like the parents were like, okay, here's another one for you, Cynthia. That's my little sister, right? And she and they just keep on feeding her presents. And here I am, little Matt, over here on the side. I'm like, hey, wait. When am I gonna give me some? And you know, and then you know, ultimately they like, well, we got you this one big present, right? Because we love you. But they kept on giving Cynthia more. Well, the idea behind this was is that there was a distribution that was getting get, that was being given, and Panetta was getting more and more simply because of the fact that she had a fruitful womb, if you will. She had produced many children, and so therefore she got plenty more. And but at the same time, Elkanah loved Hannah. It wasn't that he didn't love her, but. And so he gave her a, a worthy portion because he loved her, but that was really all she had coming to her because her womb was barren and, and she didn't have any offspring. And so that's kind of the position of it. And it says in verse 6, but it gets worse. Her adversary also pervert, provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. So what's essentially happening here is, is that Peninnah's getting all these blessings because all her children... And she sees Hannah get her one little meager portion over there. And then she turns around and she starts, she starts poking her. She starts, she starts chiding her. She starts giving her a hard time. She starts making fun of her. Oh, you, look at you. You ain't even blessed. Your, your womb's all shut up. You, your womb's barren. You, you don't have nothing coming to you. I don't know about you, but I think about this situation. I, I understand that, you know, we got a lot of men in here. We don't know what it means to have a to have a barren womb. But, but you know, there's many times in our lives that there's things that go on, right? That tragedy happens. Circumstances take place. Uh, we find ourselves with lack in our life, whatever it may be. And people on the outside looking in are kind of like poking around. Poking around and making fun. Like, look, at the, well, look at how the Lord allowed you. Now, I mean, I'm even talking about in the church. At a time, these were the people of God. 
A time that you would expect the people of God would rush to someone's defense, would go to hell. No, no, no. Instead, we're going to poke around a little bit. We're going to make fun. And, you know, a lot of times they won't do it to your face, right? But that's what they're thinking. And I don't want to get ahead of myself, but that's basically what's happening here. Verse 7. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou, and why eatest thou not? And why is your heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore. And she vowed a vow, and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto my, thy handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. And there shall no razor come upon his head. Well, you know, not, I don't want to get into too much detail, but that's talking about the Nazarite vow. And essentially, what, what, what Hannah's saying here is, is that she's asking God to give her something. She doesn't have anything. To be honest with you, she doesn't have anything to give God. So what she's doing is she's asking God to give her something so that she'll have something to give to God. Amen. And what she's saying is it's the thing that she's the most hungry for. She's most hungry for this, for this child to be able to have a fruitful womb, to be able to produce offspring. For You know, nowadays women, women find fulfillment in, in getting a career job and, and making, you know, all kinds of money and having power. And I'm not trying to pick this. Some women that do a whole lot better job than men in those positions. They do just have a different way of seeing things, crossing T's and dot and I's. So I'm not taking away from that. But there was a time when a woman felt very fulfilled, and, you know, in the fact that she was producing offspring. And it was very important for the children of Israel uh, that their whole community, their whole history surrounded that. They were waiting for the seed to come and they were the people of God and they were separated from all the nations around them and so for them to be fruitful and to produce offspring was a really was a really big deal um, and so when she, they say no razor shall come upon his head that's like what Samson was the Nazarite vow no, no razor to cut his head wouldn't drink wine okay but the idea behind it was was that he was dedicated to God it was an idea of separation just as the Christian today is to be separated unto God the idea here was that she was separating this child even before he would be born in her prayer separating him to God verse 12 it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth he paid he, he, he noticed what she was doing how Hannah, she spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard, therefore. Therefore, Eli thought she had been drunken. So when Eli sees her in the temple, she's over here. She's, she's wept, weeping sore, the Bible says. She, she's hurting. She's in pain. And she goes to the Lord in the temple. She says, I'm like, I can't eat. Are you serious? Am I going to eat? She goes to the, to the Lord in the temple and she begins to pray. And when she does, she's praying with, you know, sometimes when you pray and you're feeling like this, you might be groaning and a lot of noise might be coming out of you. But she's just in so much pain right now. Her mouth is moving. She's telling God, I'll give it. I'll give it back to you if you just give it to me. Uh, and she's praying with passion, but there's not any words coming out. She's praying from her heart. Well, when Eli sees that, he thinks she's drunk. The problem with Eli is he can't see right and he can't hear right, right? And, and many times I'll tell you this, that there's times in your life as a Christian when you will be passionate for the Lord, desiring to live for God, and people around you, people that call themselves Christians, they won't understand what's going on. They will begin to judge you and think wrongly of you whenever in reality you're over here trying to seek after the Lord, desiring to be passionate for God. Their response is going to be, something's wrong with you. You're not right. You, you're, you're drunk, you're crazy, uh, you're not sober-minded, something of that nature, you're not right. Well, I'm here to tell you, God's looking for people that will give his heart to him, That's that will right. sell out to him, amen, just the way that he sold out for us. All right, so uh, it says, and Eli said unto her, how long will you be drunken? Put away your wine from you. And Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink. But have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief 
have I spoken hitherto? In other words, my heart, I've poured my heart out of, in, in my pain. Uh, and that's what I've done today. Then Eli answered and said, go in peace and the God of Israel grant thee your petition that you have asked of him. And she said, let thy handmaid find grace in your sight. So the woman went her way and did eat and her countenance was no more sad. In other words, her facial expression was no more sad. And they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife. I mean, in other words, they became intimate. And the Lord remembered her. Wherefore, it came to pass when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. And the man Elkanah and his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice in his vow. So the next year it's time for them to go back again. But Hannah went not up. For she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him, that he may appear before the Lord, and there abide, and there abide forever. So, you know, this to me, not to get into to this too much, but it represents seasons. Because there's, there's a short season of time that Hannah's going to have with this child. And, and she's going to stay at home right now while they go up there, and she's going to continue to nurse him and breastfeed him and do take care for him. But, but the time that she makes the next trip, she's giving them him to the Lord. She's offering Samuel never to, never to have him again as her own, to dedicate him to the Lord, to give it over, to release it, and to let it go completely unto God. It says in verse 23, And Elkanah, her husband, said unto her, Do what seems good to you. Tarry until you have um, weaned him. Only the Lord establish his word. So the woman abode, or she stayed there, and gave her son suck until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine, and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh, and the child was young. So all these were sacrifices that she was bringing to offer up as she was going to bring him to the Lord. They slew a bullock and brought the child to, to Eli. And she said, Oh, my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has given me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore also have I lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. This is chapter 2, verse 1. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. So after the Lord has showed up, he's, he's given her the desires of her heart. After she prayed this prayer of pain and sorrow and poured her heart out to God. And now it's all done. She, she's, God did, she asked for God to do something. God showed up and did it. And now she's, she's doing right. Amen. And doing, giving back to the Lord what she said that she would do. And her heart is full of joy. Her heart is full, even though you would think, oh my goodness, she's, she's letting go of, you know, this prized possession that she held on to. But the reality of it is, is, is that the Lord is giving her joy in the midst of it all because she breaks out in a song. She's going to break out in a song and she's going to begin to sing the way that her heart feels. It says, my heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over my enemies. Now, you know, I've got to break this down a little bit because I don't think that I did in my message, but the word, the horn there uh, is connected to strength. Uh, animals had horns. Horns in certain types of animals represent strength, but the altar had horns on it. It represented strength and power. So the Lord would oftentimes be noted as the horn of my salvation. He is the strength of my salvation. Hannah is saying, my horn is exalted in the Lord. My strength is lifted up in the Lord my God. My mouth is enlarged over my enemies. Hannah had some enemies in her life. People that were questioning her. People that were talking bad about her. People that were provoking her. And even whenever she desired to do what was right, people that made fun of her. But now, all of a sudden, God has turned things around. And even though you would think she would be sorrowful to give away Samuel, her heart is full of joy because, well, she's been vindicated. God showed up on her behalf and he proved himself strong in her life. And the result is that her heart now has been filled with joy and she begins to praise the Lord and rejoice. Verse 2, there is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. 
when you talk about a rock, you know, one of the things, have you ever seen those pictures, like, I think it's, I'm pretty sure it's on, like, the West Coast, and, and they got these pictures of these beaches, and, and where it's probably, like, Northern California or something, where the waves, like, just, just very, very powerful, and they smash up against these rocks, these big old rocks that are there, and what you get is the picture of steadfastness, that rock ain't moving. As powerful as that ocean is, as many times as that ocean has slammed up against that big old rock, that rock has not moved. And the idea behind this particular passage of scripture is that God is a rock. No matter what's going on in your life, no matter how many times bad the storm is, no matter what smashes up against you, you need to understand that the God you serve, amen, is the rock of your salvation. He shall not be moved. There is nothing more powerful than him, amen. You might feel weary. You might feel sometimes like, you know, have you, ever, you know, recently I went to the beach and I was standing on the beach. And when I stand on the beach by the water, when the water comes up and then it comes back down, I can feel the sand shifting. You know what I'm talking about? It's kind of like it, kind of, it starts pulling out from under your feet and you can feel the way. Well, guess what? We're not supposed to be standing on shifting sand. The mankind and everything around us on this earth is like shifting sand. But the God that we serve is like a rock. He shall not be moved. Amen. And if we will learn to trust in him and to stand with him and to stand on him, he is our strength. Amen. And he will not be moved. Verse three, talk no more exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. <laughs> and the saying, hey, all you that have been talking trash about me, all you that have been running your mouth about me, you better watch how you talk because God has vindicated me. He has shown up. He has proven himself in my life. For the Lord is a God of knowledge and by him actions are This God knows the intent of the man of man's heart. He sees through. All, we can present ourselves a certain way. We can behave a certain way. Act like we got it all together. God sees through. He knows the motives of people's yeah, hearts. Yeah. He knows what they're thinking, what they're scheming, what they're planning. And listen, and she, that's what Hannah's wanting everybody to know. You, you, need, to be, you need to be careful because God sees through it all. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumble are girded with strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread. In other words, he turns the tables. You were strong and you had a bow. Guess what? God broke it. You were full. Now, guess what? You're selling yourself for bread. God will turn things around. God will change circumstances in people's life. The rich become poor. The poor become rich is basically what she's saying. They that were hungry ceased so that the barren has borne seven. And she that had many children is waxed feeble. The Lord kills and the makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and lifts up. He raises up the poor out of the dust and lifts up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes, to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he hath set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints and the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength shall no man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king, and exalt the horn of his anointed. In the middle of all, in, in, in the end of this song that she sang, I don't want us to pass up that little last part of verse uh, 10. She makes a comment, you know, I realize now as I'm even standing here talking to you about it, that this song that she sang was prophetic. Not, not only was she singing about something that had actually taken place in her life, she had been vindicated and her heart was full of joy and she was giving thankfulness to God for showing up in her life. So she was praising him through this song, but she actually was operating as a prophetess right here. I mean, that's pretty, that's powerful now because, you know, you got to think about it because nowadays in some churches, people think that women ought to not be, ought to not preach the gospel. And I'm here to say, I don't agree with that one bit. God has used women in the Bible, in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament. And this woman right here, Hannah, she gave a prophetic utterance because this is specifically talking about the king. She doesn't even realize right now that God's about to anoint a king coming up in several years. And not only that, she doesn't even realize that this child that she has given birth to has a huge role to play in the anointing of this king. This is so powerful, even because I'm getting more and more revelation of how significant this is of her singing this in this psalm. Because I got to tell you where it says he shall give strength unto his king. He's talking about 
He's talking about David, King, she's talking about King David. God's talking about King David through her. Saul hasn't even been called upon yet. And so the children of Israel don't even know, you know, they've cried out for a king. But at this point in time, Saul hasn't even been anointed yet. David is the one that God wanted anointed, and he's not even on the picture yet. But what she says is, and exalt the horn of his anointed. In other words, lift up the horn, the power of his anointed. And, you know, what's interesting also is, is this, is that whenever you go, when you fast forward, okay, in the story, uh, you know, just to kind of share this with you. When you fast forward in the story, it's one of my favorite I like to think of this part of the Bible, and I always tell it, and some of y'all are probably bored with it. But whenever Samuel went to go anoint, God called Samuel to anoint the next king of Israel after Saul. What God, what, what, what Samuel, uh, what, what God told Samuel was, how long will you mourn for Saul? How long will you mourn for Saul? Get, right, get your horn. And go anoint the next king. The horn was also used as a sign of strength, but also used to carry oil in it. And so whenever, but he told him, he said, whenever you go to find him, he said, don't look at his, out, his stature, how tall he is, or his outward appearance. Man looks at the outside, I look at the heart. God determines the worth of a man based upon his heart. He sees what's going on on the inside of man. We look at man on the outside. We look at all the mess he's been in. We look at the way he dresses, the car he drives. We make judgments based upon all of that kind of stuff, how they look, how they act. All that stuff is how we judge people. But God says, I'm looking at the inside. I'm looking at the inside of a person's heart. And so God told Samuel, you raise up, you get your horn, you go anoint the next king. And, but don't you look at how tall he is because the first son, Eliab, was, of Jesse, was tall just like Saul would have been. So the natural, and he was handsome. So the natural idea would be he must be the right king. Anyway, to make a long story short, Samuel goes through all of them boys and none of them were the right king. God was revealing to Samuel that it wasn't the right one. And there was one more left, that young boy, that young shepherd boy that was in the field that was learning how to care for, for his daddy's sheep with a heart of compassion and concern for the sheep. See, that's where God was, God was preparing him. God was preparing him in the field to be not a king that rules over or lords over as some tyrant over his people, but instead one that would care for and have a heart of compassion for God's people. God was preparing him in the sheep field. And whenever they called David, he shows up and he sees the prophet in his town and they, be, they poured that hot oil over his head and he was anointed by God. The point that I'm saying is that's after Samuel is an old man. That's after Samuel is grown up. Right now, he's just been born. He's just been dedicated to the temple and his mother sings this song and prophetically speaks up. God talking about that God, he shall give strength to his king, talking about David, and exalt the horn of his anointed, her son as an old man would end up going and anointing this young king that, that God had called long before. The point that I'm trying to make with all that is this, is that God has a big old plan and he uses individual people like you and I in the midst of that plan. And many times we don't even understand on the front end how he's going to use us in that plan. But we, like Hannah, have to be able to trust God. Amen. And even when we don't have anything to give God, we cry out to God that he give us something so that we in return can give back to him. And so that's what ended up happening in Hannah's life. So once again, I, um, I titled this morning's message, a seed of faith and a harvest from God. Sometimes, you know, now in the modern church, uh, the idea of seed faith is always really a lot of times connected to a financial blessing, you know, sow you a seed of this much money and you're going to get this much in return. And I have to tell you that you can't out give God. And that many times whenever you give financially, God will turn around and bless you financially. There's no question about that. But the whole premise of God's plan surrounds seed time, seed sowing and harvest. And really, if I was going to try to communicate to you best what I think of the essence of Hannah is that she sowed a spiritual seed. And what I mean by a spiritual seed is that when you sow into the spirit, you of the spirit reap. A lot of times the spiritual seeds that we sow are not really the way we would have done it. I mean, who in their right mind is going to ask God for a child just to turn around and give that child away? 
But that's what God put in Hannah's heart. She doesn't understand why God would put that in her heart, but that's what she prayed. And when we pray a spiritual prayer that lines up with God's will, God will reach down and he will answer that prayer. And, and you know, it's as though sowing spiritual seed and the result of that is a spiritual harvest. So it's as though Samuel is a spiritual seed, but in the end, she receives a spiritual harvest when it's all said and done. The way that you know it's his will is that it's not just connected to your pleasure. Instead, it's connected to the overall will of God. In this passage of scripture, Hannah's seed of faith was connected to the big plan of God. She didn't understand it completely, but she was willing to believe God according to his will. Once again, this passage of scripture is, is, it takes place in the time frame of the judges. And there's one scripture that speaks well of this whole time frame, Judges 17 and 6. It really gives us, I mean, I kind of explained to you a little bit the spiritual condition of the, of the leadership. But this will actually give you a picture of the spiritual condition of the society in general. It says, uh, in those days, there was no king in Israel, but every man, man did that which was right in his own eyes. So mankind at this time, the nation of Israel, they had no leadership. But what they did was they made decisions and they lived their lives according to what they thought was right. And the society was full of problems and full of sin. And we see the spiritual condition of the leadership and that there was no real regard for the things of God. There's so much importance in this verse when we understand the history of Israel and God's overall plan for man. We can look backwards and realize that God's desire was to give Israel a king that would ultimately provide a family through which he would give the king of the world. And this story, like so many others in the Old Testament surrounds the truth that God's great plan for humanity is played out in the lives of individual people, real people, real people with circumstances that experience pain, that experience heartache. And this story is no different as we see with the life of Hannah. Time and again, God uses people who seem to be without strength or hope in their circumstance because in the end, he receives the glory Amen. for his accomplishments. Amen. And so once again, we see these real lives played out and the people that God is using are experiencing these pain. We find all of these truths in the story of Hannah. She wouldn't have known all the details, but God needed a prophet that could hear his voice and see his will. It wouldn't be too many years away that God would need a prophet to anoint the king that he had planned for his people. And during the time frame of the judges, and specifically during this time, God's people were too busy living for themselves to pay attention to the will of God. Specifically, the situation with Eli and his sons posed a major problem for God, God's will, because Eli was growing old and couldn't hear the Lord, and his sons were living sinful and rebellious lives that were in opposition to God. We'll look at a couple of different passages that show that. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. This talks about uh, Samuel as he's a little older. He's still a child. And he's living in the temple with Eli. And he's ministering in the temple before the Lord. And it describes where Eli is now in his life. It says, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. Meaning, when it says precious, it was a scarcity. You know, whenever... Um, that's why in the commodity market, not that I know much about the exchange of commodities, but uh, or commodities or, or precious metals... Whenever certain things happen to the market, the price of gold skyrockets or, or whenever certain precious metals are scarce, their value increases. That's the idea. The word of the Lord was scarce, therefore it was precious to hold on to. It was almost like if you were hungry and in the midst of a famine, you'd, you'd reach for, you'd cling to every crumb of bread that you could grab a hold of. And in this time frame, the word of the Lord was very scarce, therefore it was precious. There was no open vision. The prophets weren't receiving from the Lord like they used to at this time. It came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was and Samuel was laid down to sleep. And so we see a picture. Once again, I'm just trying to show you a picture. I know we already discussed it. Of the spiritual condition of what was going on. Verse, 1 Samuel chapter 2 verses 12 through 17. 
It says, Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial, and they knew not the Lord. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant came while the flesh was in seething with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand, and he struck it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came there. Also before they burnt the fat, the priest's servant came, said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee, but raw. And if any man said unto him, Let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desires, then he would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it to me now. And if not, I will take it by force. Wherefore, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. What is that? What is going on here? What does this even mean? It means that there was, according to the law, a certain portion of the sacrifice that was to be given back to the priest. Right? Um, but at the same time, there was a certain portion that belonged to the Lord. And the portion that belonged to the Lord was the fat. It was a sweet-smelling savor unto God. Didn't belong to the priest, didn't belong to the man that was offering the sacrifice, it belonged to God. And it was to go on the altar to God. And they, these men, these young boys, they didn't wait around to receive the offering <coughs> that the people were supposed to give. They sent their servant with some kind of a three-pronged flesh hook to just walk up and just start jerking stuff out of people's pots. <laughs> this, is, this is what the priest wants, and this is what he's going to get. And if you don't like it, then it's just tough, and he just starts snatching whatever it was that they wanted. He said, oh, and by the way, you want the fat too. And don't say that you're going to offer that up to the Lord. No, we want the fat. And the point was, to, what, it, what it really means is, they had no regard. They had no regard for the sacrifice of God. When you have no regard for the sacrifice of God, it means you have no regard for the blood of Jesus. It means you have no regard for the work that God has been in the, in the midst of. That's what the Old Testament sacrifice was a picture of. It was a picture of the coming Jesus that would die on the cross. It's in, the world just thinks, oh, this is just a, a, a far gone you know, situation that doesn't have any meaning. No, God, this is God's plan. This is God's purposeful plan to save humanity, to be able to have a relationship with him, to deal with this sin problem. And whenever humanity throws that to the back burner or God's uh, preachers throw that to the back burner and, and act as though the, that the cross is no longer relevant or it's not the message that we preach, that it's not about the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ that we should emphasize, then now we're kicking against or we're taking lightly the plan of God or the sacrifice of God. That's what was going on here. In a social climate where the people did what was right in their own eyes and the leadership disregarded God and his sacrifice, there was a young woman who was barren and ridiculed and hurting really bad. She didn't have anything to give God, so she asked God to give her something so that she could turn right around and give back to him. Instead of staying in a place of hopelessness, she sought out the will of God. She was in pain, but she looked past her own pain and asked God to use her for his purposes. So what I see is a situation here where if I was going to plug myself into Hannah's life, Sometimes we find ourselves in situations, we find ourselves in painful circumstances, but God's got a bigger plan than what I'm going through today. And I can make a choice and listen to me, we're going to go back and forth. If we're real with one another, we're going to go back and forth where we're going to experience pain and we're going to feel sorry for ourselves to some extent for where we are. And then next thing you know, we're going to feel strength from the Lord and he's going to lift us up and there's probably going to be a vacillation that goes on to some extent in our heart and life when we go through these things. But we got to be reminded and we got to look to Hannah, amen, as a, as, a, as, a, as a remembrance that God will move in the midst of our circumstances. The first point that I wanted to make or the first thing that I saw in this passage of Scripture was that people add pain to pain. Whenever you are living your life, I wish I could tell you that you were going to meet a whole bunch of good people out there and everybody's going to just treat you right and everybody's going to make you feel good about yourself. Reality is, is that that's not going to happen. The majority of the time, I've, I've, I'm, I'm, look, I know I'm getting older, but I still don't feel like I'm old. But I am old enough to know this. People are going to let you down. That sounds bad. Oh, preacher, 
you're so negative. No, I'm just real. I'm just being real with you. Amen. People are going to let you down. And the problem that you're going to run into is if you don't learn how to just let that stuff slide off your back, listen to me. The preacher, if you hang around all up, I'm going to let you down. I hate to keep saying that, but I want to get it into your head in case I ever let you down. <laughs> if your relationship with God is totally contingent upon me and how I handle my business, you're in a bind. If your relationship with God is totally contingent on how everybody else that calls himself a Christian around you handles their business, you're in a bind. Because I'm going to let you down. The person on the side of you will probably let you down. Somebody that calls himself a Christian somewhere is going to let you down. Is going to hurt you. Is going to make you feel really, really bad about the situation and about other people in general. And you're just not going to want to trust. Guess what? God didn't cause that person to let you down. God's not. That's not God's character to let you down. God's a rock. He doesn't change. God's strong. He breaks the enemy's bows. God shows up on your behalf, amen, and gives you strength and encouragement. Amen. But people are messed up. Christian people are messed up half the time more than the world. People add pain to pain. That's what was going on in Anna's life. 1 Samuel 1, 4 through 7, we read it already. When the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Peninnah his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb, and her adversary, that other wife, also provoked her sore, for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. I mean, these words fret, provoke, pr provoked her sore. I mean, the idea when you start looking at these words is really what's happening is, is that she is being chided and she's being messed with so bad emotionally that she's to the point where she is literally shaking with so much. There's, there's, she's in the midst of a situation that she cannot change. The Lord has shut up her womb. She can't change it. You might find yourself one day in the midst of a situation that you cannot change. I don't know if you've been like that lately, but I've definitely been like that at least at some point in time in my life where I was so angry, so frustrated that I was literally shaking with so much anger and that was because I couldn't fix it. And every time I tried to turn around and fix it, I just made a bigger mess of the whole thing. I mean, as a teenager, dude, don't try this, teenagers. But I, I would punch walls. I'd punch. Oh, man, I can remember one time I was in detention home and it couldn't, couldn't get out of the situation. I had created my own situation. And I was so angry. And they had a screen on the window, like a big heavy-duty gay screen. I started punching that thing. That was the stupidest thing I ever did. I still remember that. I mean, I had no skin left on my hands. What was I thinking? I wasn't thinking. I was just so full of frustration, so full of anger, and, and, and trying to fix something. You can't fix that. You can't get yourself out of that. You got yourself in it, but you can't get yourself out. Poor Hannah didn't even get herself in it. It just is what it is. She don't even know how to get out. So she is visibly, she is fretting. She is, she is stressing. And, and she is hurting. And instead of somebody going to help her, they just poke her. They just poke her and chide her and make it worse. When they would go to the annual feast, Elkanah's other wife would make fun of the fact that Hannah was barren. And then when she goes to pour out her heart to God, Eli the priest thought she was drunk. Here she is. I mean, she just can't win for losing. Here, here the adversary is chiding her, provoking her, making her feel filled with fear and hurt. And he, I mean, her emotions are probably all over the place. She goes to, to be with the Lord, to pour her heart out to God. And what happens? The, the, the man of God makes fun of her. So it says, tells her she's drunk. And I learned some things as I've gone through some trials in my life, and I learned that when bad things happen, people are often ready to view your circumstances as, as though you deserved what you got. Right. Amen. And that they are better than you, and that God must not really love you if you let all this happen to you. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever felt that way before. Most people, they won't have the audacity to do what Peninnah did. I mean, most people are not going to just straight up look you in the eyeballs and poke you and provoke you and make fun of you. 
Um, and so they won't provoke you to your face, but it's something that you can feel. When something bad happens to you, you can tell that people are feeling a certain way about you, talking about you behind your back. Now, i got to be honest with you. To some extent, it's the enemy also playing games with your head. The enemy will use circumstances like that to magnify it and to make it worse in your own mind than what it may really be. Now, i got to tell you that that's a problem that I've had in the past. I thank God that he has to some extent delivered me because it's kind of like one of those things, too, where I can't fix that either. <laughs> I, I can't fix it if they're making fun of me or they're talking about me, and I can't fix it. You know, if the enemy's using that, I can't change it. So I've really, by the grace of God, learned, do you talking? Do you talking? I can't change you. But I know one thing, the Lord is my defense. And whatever I got coming to me, amen, the Lord will show up for me. I cry out to him. He will help me. Amen. He will get me through this thing. Um, I can't change you anyway. You know, and so I'm just trying to encourage you to know that if you sit there and you focus all your all your energy on trying to change something that you can't even change, you're just going to frustrate yourself. And you got to learn, amen, how to trust God. And you need to expect that people are going to add pain to pain. And you need to expect that people are going to poke and chide whenever bad things happen. And the enemy is more than happy to help them do it. Because what he really wants to do is he wants to destroy you completely. He wants to break you down and beat you down so bad that you'll give up and quit on the Lord. I mean, and listen, there's a whole lot of different scenarios where this can play out. Loss of family members. Messed up in relationships. Job situations. A lot of different things that causes people on the outside to start talking. Right? Yeah, I know what I'm talking about. And I'm telling you, if I don't say anything else about this, I'm going to say this again. I'm going to say it again. Please, let me slow down. The enemy will magnify it in your mind. I thank God that the Lord showed me that. That a lot of times I was creating something. I was allowing the enemy to create something in my own mind. It wasn't even really as bad as what it was. Are they out there talking trash? Yes, they are. But that's what people in the world do. And how do you know it? Because you used to do it too. Yeah. Did you not? Did you not used to talk trash about people? You know what I mean? And maybe some people do it more than others. But but some people got a gossip problem. Oh yeah, young people, y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all want to act like y'all are holy. That's all y'all do whenever y'all are with y'all's friends. Talking trash about everybody. Beating them up. Your best friend. Oh, Lord, did you see that lipstick she had? Or did you see that toenail polish? Oh, Lord, that was... Uh, did you see that outfit she was wearing? To dogging people. Right? right? And, and, and beating them down. And talking bad about them. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, we, we're laughing, but, but we, I, don't, I don't understand why we do that. I don't, I, don't, I don't understand why we do that as God's people. <coughs> Amen. That's in nature. That's exactly right. So the first thing I wanted you to hear this morning was is that people add pain to pain. Second thing is, is that while people add pain to pain, you're not supposed to trust people anyway. So point number two is give it all to God. Amen. Amen. That's what Hannah did. She just gave it all to God. First Samuel chapter one, verses nine through eleven. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten at Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore. And she vowed a vow, and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Once again, the words bitterness of soul, the words wept sore. Hannah found herself in a situation that was very painful. There were people around her that were making it worse and she couldn't fix it. So she went to the one that could. She cried out to the Lord and promised to give everything that was so important to her back to him. And this is an ongoing occurrence that takes place in the scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, uh, in the lives of God's people. He puts them in a situation that tests them and then gives them the opportunity to live for him and give themselves for him and his purposes. He did it with Abraham. Abraham cried out to God and said, I don't have an, an, a, you know, an offspring. God turns around and gives him Isaac and then says, now you got to give it back to me. 
And, and you know, the, the same of Mary. He asked Mary to give everything. I mean, for that young girl to be willing to give her life to this cause, to, to face the ridicule that she would have had to face and, and the circumstances that she would have had to face to give up a normal life. Yet at the same time, she said, I'll do it for you, Lord. I'll sacrifice this for you. And in the end, God turns around and blesses them. In these situations that God puts us in, it appears senseless to the people on the outside, but what others don't realize, even what the person in the test doesn't realize, is that God isn't just going to ask you to give it all to him. He will definitely give back to you. And that's what, something that ends up happening in Hannah's life. God doesn't just take, amen, he is a God of blessing, and he does give back. So that was point number one, people add pain to pain. But point number two is you need to give it all to God. Trust him. Trust the one, amen, that can change things. Number three, though, is this. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 26 through 28, she said, O my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here, praying unto the Lord for this child I prayed, and the Lord has given me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord as long as he lives. He shall be lent to the Lord and he worshiped the Lord there. You know, once again, we got this situation where uh, Peninnah is provoking and poking. Eli is laughing and calling her drunk. And when it's all said and done, Hannah ends up showing up after the baby's born and says, here he is. Amen. Remember that baby I was praying for that day when you thought I was crazy and drunk? The Lord showed up and he vindicated me. The Lord showed up, amen, and he produced what he said he would produce. And here it is right here. The fruit of the Lord, amen, has amen. shown up. Deuteronomy 32, 35, and then we'll look at Romans 12, 19. In Deuteronomy 32, 35, it says, To me belongs vengeance. That's what God's saying. Vengeance is the Lord's. And recompense. In other words, to pay somebody back. It belongs to God. Their foot shall slide in due time. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to stress about getting somebody back. The Lord said, if it's, if it's coming to them, their foot will slide. I will cause their foot to slip when the time is right. For the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. Romans chapter 12, verse 19, the Apostle Paul used this scripture and he gave a little bit even more explanation. It says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. The, the meaning of give place unto wrath means to leave room for God's wrath to work. When you try to, to retaliate, when you try to to fix the situation in your own strength, God's backing off. He said, oh, you want to handle this yourself? That's how, that's how you want to do this? Well, then I'll let you take the reins. Like Carrie Underwood said, did Jesus take the wheel? You want to keep your hands on the wheel? I'll let you keep your hands on the wheel if you want to drive this vehicle. But if you want me to intervene, if you want me to have my way in the situation, you need to leave room for what it is. It's not that our heart, you know, there has to be balance between that. I, I've never personally prayed a prayer like this before. Lord, heap fire, coals of fire on their head, Lord. I'm leaving room for your vengeance that you would show up in the midst of this situation and that you would prove yourself, make your righteous servant look right before the eyes of the people, and I pray that you'd rain down fire and brimstone in their life. I, I'm not going to pray that. That seems weird to pray that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, dude, I know God don't feel that way. Sometimes, boy, I tell you, man, no, but when you really get into the presence of the Lord and people have done you wrong, then what happens is your heart softens. Your heart softens and you're like, you know, Lord, I pray that you would do a work in this situation. I pray that you would do something for their heart. That's what the Bible says. Pray for those who despitefully use you. And when you do that, though, the Lord knows how to handle it. Make room. So whenever you find yourself in circumstances and situations and people have taken advantage of you and people have made fun of you and people have poked at you because of your negative situation, don't try to take matters into your own hands and retaliate. Don't try to, don't let bitterness get in your heart for you to come up with some scheme to get them back. Put it in the hands of the Lord, amen, and let him have his way. There's so many times that we want to take matters into our own hands whenever people treat us improperly, but we need to trust God that he will take care of us and that in the end, 
we will be protected and that his will for our lives will be accomplished. Number four, God is looking for someone that will give him praise when he moves in their circumstances. I'm not going to read it all over again, but basically that was Hannah's song that she sung. He is the horn of, he, he, he has lifted up the horn of my strength. The horn of my strength is lifted up in the Lord. God is my rock. Amen. The, the bows of the strong have been broken. And, and she goes on and she sings this song about how God showed up in her situation. How God showed up in her circumstance. Even though things looked hopeless. Even though things looked helpless. She trusted in God and God showed up. And when it was all said and done, what does she do? She fills her mouth up with praise for God. And she begins to sing a song unto the Lord. You know, God is looking for somebody that will give him praise. Amen. God is looking for somebody that will speak for him. God, God wants to move in the lives of his people and he wants to intervene and he wants to cause things to happen and change in their lives. And he's looking to do that in people's lives that he knows are going to turn around and give him glory. Because this whole earth, whether we understand it or not, with this whole thing, God is worthy of glory. Amen? And, and so that's what he's looking for is that people, when he turns situations around, will say, you know what? The Lord did that. I can't tell you how many times. It's like sometimes I'll tell my story and it doesn't even start off really as planning to witness. But somehow I get into the fact that, you know, I was a high school dropout and, you know, arrested to all this stuff and whatever the case and then, and I'm saying it at the clinic, so I'm the nurse practitioner, I'm seeing these people's kids. Because I don't know, somebody might have gone through a mess. I tell people, man, I don't care if they feel like it's professional or not. People are going through stuff. And so if they open up to me and there's something going on in their life, and I'll say, yeah, well, I went, went through, oh, man, look at what you've done for yourself. Oh, you've done so good. No. <laughs> I ain't taking the glory for this one because you don't know. I don't think you understand. <laughs> you don't realize the mess that I was. You don't realize how hopeless I was. You don't realize it, it was bad. There was no way of me getting out of my situation. God showed up. Oh, he might. Other people might have fixed it themselves. I can't tell you that there's no story of world power out there. I can't tell you that there's no story of people that had hard times that, that lifted themselves up and even rose to higher heights than what Matt Hebert did. But I'm here to tell you right now, that's not what happened in Matt Hebert's life. God showed up. Yeah. God showed up in his life and he did a work in Matt's life. He changed Matt's life. Amen. And, and now he began to lead Matt in the direction that he wanted Matt to go. And so I, I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to say that. And so now I got to praise the Lord for it. Sometimes I don't even necessarily always feel like praising the Lord. Is it okay if I'm honest with you? Sometimes I'm going through things in my own life. But whenever that opportunity happens, when the door opens up, next thing you know, I can't help myself. My, you know, on the inside of my belly is the word of the Lord. And on the inside of my belly is praise for God. It has to come out and somebody needs to hear the goodness of God. Amen. And how he operates in people's lives. Hannah was ridiculed by both her, both her husband's other wife and Eli, but in the end, God came through for her. She was weak and void of strength. She was empty and had no way to accomplish what her heart desired, but God showed up and proved himself strong in her life. The result was that she gave voice and praised the God of Israel. She trusted God to remedy her situation, and when, she, when he did, she praised him for it. Amen? Number five, and this is the last one. God gives more than we can ask for. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 20 through 21. And Eli blessed Elkanah and his wife and said, The Lord give thee seed of this woman for the loan which is lent to the Lord. And they went unto their own home, and the Lord visited Hannah, so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. And the child Samuel grew before the Lord. <laughs> and that's um, See, that's how I kind of got the idea. What am I titled this message? And I started thinking, Hannah sowed a seed of faith and received the harvest back from the Lord. Not only did was her seed of faith connected to God's overall plan, amen, but that God turned around and in her own individual life, he blessed her with the desires of her heart. She went through and did what God desired her to do. That's a very spiritual thing. Listen to me. Think about how selfish we all are. Yeah. Think about how the motives of our heart and how we're thinking these things through. And I are like, Lord, if you'll do this, then I'll do this. Her thing, she kind of said that, but her thing was, Lord, if you give me this, I'm going to give it back to you. And God saw the motives of her heart. He saw the desires of her heart. And when it was all said and done, he blessed her 
with the desires of her heart. She ended up with five children to raise for herself. Plus Samuel, amen, was used by God and served the Lord uh, all the days of his life. So often we consume ourselves with attempting to remedy our own needs, but Hannah focused on what God desired. More than anything, she wanted to please the Lord and have an opportunity to give to him. In the end, he gave back to her a harvest. It was as though Samuel was like a seed and God returned a harvest to her of offspring. I'm going to close with this scripture. Ephesians 3, 20 through 21. It says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. The idea there is this, is that, you know what? Uh, God can do more than we could ever imagine. Amen. Your situation might look hopeless. Your situation might be really, be really painful. It might be bad. But at the same time, we got to remember that God can do above what we ever expected him to do. And so we have to learn to trust him. Amen. Amen. Maybe this morning you're here and you're like, I, I don't really know the Lord. You know, I heard you. I just, I just want to encourage you this morning. I don't care how old you are. You need to understand that God has a plan. Amen. And that God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then it means that you're not born again. And if you're not born again, then you're not promised tomorrow. The Bible, the Bible, as a matter of fact, the Bible says you're not promised tomorrow anyway. Like, in other words, you could literally, well, I'm not trying to freak you out and scare you into get, get, giving your heart to Jesus. But the Bible says you're not promised tomorrow. Today is the day. People, multitudes are in the valley of decision. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to make a choice for the Lord. And to choose whether or not you would serve him. To choose whether or not you would give your heart to him. And what you need to understand is this. Is that if you never receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you never ask God to forgive you of your sins. Then you're not born again. And if you're not born again. Then if you die you're not going to heaven. And the re it's not that God's cruel. It's that God has a specific plan. And the specific plan is that he did all of this work to create this nation, to give us Jesus, who died on the cross to pay the penalty of our sin. And now he's asking us, when we hear that message, to put our faith in that. And when we do, God gives us Jesus' righteousness, and Jesus takes our guilt and sorrow and pain and shame on him. There's an exchange that takes place, and now God can receive us as his own. Amen.